Welcome to Illuminati Silver. We tell you the truth about silver. Today is Sunday the 7th of June 2020 and yesterday we published our Gold and Silver Weekly Update for the week ending the 5th of June where we reported that both Gold and Silver were under pressure last week especially after the rather positive non-farm payroll report which was published on Friday. The result was that Gold fell $46 last week from $1,731 to 1,685, and silver fell 45 cents from $17.90 to $17.45. Now we promised yesterday that today's podcast would be a little different from the norm in that we're going to talk about education and university spending. Now before you switch off, there is a reason for this, which we will explain towards the end of the video, and it is relevant to precious metals longer term. So let's take a brief look at a Bloomberg article on private universities launching and establishing themselves in China. Bloomberg article, dated 5th of June 2020. Headline, Prestigious UK Schools Push On With Plans To Open In China. Harrow, the 450-year-old boarding school that produced seven prime, Brit prime British ministers, including Winston Churchill, is poised to open five schools in China, undeterred by COVID-19. Other prestigious English schools will likely follow, staking their post-pandemic futures on East Asia. Demand for English language international schools in the region is projected to double by 2029, with 1.2 million students enrolled, ISC research estimates. The perception China has managed the pandemic better than most is likely to increase its appeal relative to the more frontier economies that had begun attracting foreign schools as the Chinese market matured. China is tried and tested. It can be made to work, said Paul Jones, a partner at Farrer & Co., a London-based law firm that advises on international education. Schools are saying others have made it work, and right now I don't want to be the first to make a foray into new territories. English language education has burgeoned into a $55 billion market in the past two decades as a growing middle class in China, the Middle East and beyond sees the language skills and academic rigour as a way to give their children a leg up in a global labour market. The histories of UK's top schools give them a recruiting edge and pushing abroad generates funds that can be ploughed into scholarships at home as they seek to broaden access beyond the elite. Harrow has been one of the pioneers of the global push, opening a school in Bangkok in 1998. Last year it educated 4,800 students at four schools in Thailand, Hong Kong and China. That's almost six times the number of students that attend the famed boarding school on a 300-acre campus in northwest London. That gap is about to get much bigger with new China schools. Harrow's international partner, Asia International School Limited, will add 1,500 students with the opening of the new schools in September. Lockdowns did temporarily disrupt construction and in-person recruitment events were cancelled, but the schools remain on track to open and enrolment and staffing levels are holding up, said Elvina Tsun, AISL's Group Director for Marketing and Communications. It looks like China has much better control over this and it has given back confidence to our teachers and the foreigners who will come to China to work, Sun said. When UK schools go abroad, they generally enter into a kind of long-term franchising agreement where they lend their name and the educational expertise with the local partner acquiring and running the school. The UK institution will receive some upfront fees for development costs, but the bulk of the revenue comes from annual payments that generally range from 3 to 8% of student fees, Joan said. That additional revenue allows schools to offer more financial aid in the United Kingdom at a time they're facing growing pressure to become more diverse. The very existence of private schools has always been a political issue, with many in the Labour Party lobbying to abolish them and redistribute their assets. In the 2017-18 school year, Harrow received more than £3 million from its international schools. That helped it offer £2.3 million in financial aid, meaning more than 10% of students didn't pay anywhere near the £42,000 annual fee. 
When you start multiplying across five sites, the monies do start becoming the transformational amount that in an ideal world the schools are looking for, Jones said. To be sure, it is tougher for new entrants to break in, particularly in larger cities where the pioneering schools have already set up shop. If you don't have a great principal who understands how the local government and education system works, and you're not in a tier one city, it will take you six to eight years to fill a 1,000 student campus, which is too slow for most investors, said Claudia Wang, partner at Oliver Wyman, an educational consultant. Wellington opened its first school in China in 2011 and now has five in the country, plus one in Thailand opened in 2018. Wellington educates more than 4,000 students outside the United Kingdom. That's about four times the number at its day and boarding schools of South London. In uncertain times ahead, the international income adds an extra level of financial support, says Scott Bryan, international director at Wellington College. Wellington, like Harrow, has also branched out to support bilingual schools opened by its local partner that follows the Chinese national curriculum, which is mandatory for years one to nine. That shift will make the schools less dependent on expatriate families who are more transient and likely to pull up stakes when faced with local disruptions like a pandemic. Of the more than 359,000 students enrolled in international schools in the country, two-thirds are Chinese nationals, according to ISC research. The market is still changing at the moment, Brian said. We think there could be some dip, but we don't think it's a long-term issue. OK, so now you're asking yourselves, what the heck has this got to do with our channel? Well, let us tell you. It's another sign that in spite of all of the concerns about China and deteriorating East-West relations, there are serious entities, businesses, and educational establishments which still have confidence in China longer term. Now before anyone discards this, let's look at another article which shows that China is recovering first out of this global pandemic crisis and believes that it may even capitalize upon it and gain an advantage over the rest of the world. Bloomberg article dated June 7th, 2020. Headline. China trades surplus surges to record as medical exports jump. China's trade surplus surged to a record in May as exports fell less than expected, helped by an increase in medical-related sales and imports slumped along with commodity prices. Exports decreased 3.3% in dollar terms from a year earlier, beating economists' estimates, while imports plunged 16.7%. That resulted in a trade surplus of $62.93 billion. The record surplus comes as the price of commodities China buys, such as crude oil, natural gas and soybeans, declined. Exports, meantime, have come off their lows, helped in part by sales of masks and other medical supplies as countries around the world battle to stem the spread of the coronavirus. The recent acceleration in export growth of anti-epidemic materials contributed considerably to China's exports, CICC analyst Lu Lu wrote in a note, China's full-year exports growth in 2020 may be better than our previous expectations. Net exports of goods and services in the second quarter will increase substantially from a year earlier, swinging to a large positive contribution to GDP growth after drag dragging in the first quarter, Lu wrote. Exports of medical devices increased 88.5% according to CICC. While China increased commodities imports, the average price has fallen, according to a statement from the Customs Bureau. The average purchase price of crude oil slumped 21.2% in yuan terms in the first five months of the year, although the volume of purchases rose 5.2%, it said. The price for coal, natural gas, soybean and other commodities also dropped. The value of auto imports shrunk by 31.3%. The slump in imports is mainly due to a high base from last year, and the fall in commodity prices, said Xing Xiaoping, an economist at Australia New Zealand Banking Group Limited in Shanghai. The volume of most major import items rose, showing China's economy is gradually recovering. The export of textile products, including masks, jumped 25.5% in yuan terms in the first five months, the second largest export item 
after mechanical products according to the customs. China's economy continued its slow recovery from the coronavirus slump in May, the earliest indicators showed, with domestic demand gaining momentum while globally it remained sluggish. But the rising risk of an escalation in US-China tensions threatens the outlook for China's foreign trade. Exports remained resilient as industrial output continued to recover to normal levels and manufacturers benefit from the shift in supply chains as industrial hubs in the EU and US were shut down during the time, according to Rajiv Bivas, APAC's chief economist at IHS Market in Singapore. With lockdowns ending across the EU and US, new orders for Chinese exports should gradually recover during the third and fourth quarters as Christmas season supports a rebound in new orders, he said. End of article. With such striking data coming out of China and various establishments looking to reinvest, it really does appear that the likes of global investor Jim Rogers, who originally stated a number of years ago that the future lies in Asia, really should make us all sit up and think. If the data is accurate and international relations improve eventually, we will see a shift of economic power continue to move from the west to the east, and this, in our view, will undoubtedly be precious metal positive. Ironically, we're faced with a paradox. Support a country whose methodology is to steal your intellectual property rights and eventually dominate markets, which will prove positive for gold and silver because of their affinity for precious metals, or alternatively decry such an entity and put at risk global populism for what we all like to collect, save and stack. It's an interesting dilemma, one in which we would appreciate your thoughts. Thank you so much for listening, and if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel and press the bell sign so that you're notified of our videos as and when they are published. We hope you have found this video interesting and informative, and if so, please give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. Please ensure that you have subscribed to our channel and press the bell sign so that you are notified of any future videos. Also kindly visit our website at IlluminatiSilver.com and if you haven't already done so, please subscribe either as a free or paying member for regular email updates and offers. Disclaimer. Illuminati Silver owners come from a background of banking, international wealth management and economics. Having now retired from these worlds, we are not qualified to give investment advice. Therefore, this and other productions must not be deemed to be giving such advice and merely represent the personal views of its owners. Music